My name is Jeff Faulkner. I am a Kenyan Fellow, years 2012-2013, uh, and I brought someone else with me here today. Hi, everybody. I'm Glenda Harrison. I am the After School Initiatives Coordinator at the Morehead Planetarium and Science Center uh, at UNC Chapel Hill. And we'll have our information if you want to talk to us or communicate after this session. Again, thank you for allowing us to come. Uh, this session is about how STEM education, in my experiences, has changed uh, more over my school, my class, and also our district. Uh, I'm going to start by giving you a little background on me. Uh, again, I was Keenan Fellow, and I work with Moorhead. This is why I asked them to come down here with us, because Moorhead Planetarium and Keenan Fellows actually shape the way I do science education in my classrooms now. And I think it was a very instrumental part of me becoming better at science or better instructional leader in my, in my school. So, to give you kind of a, another picture of who I am, this is me. You might have seen this picture, I'm famous. And if you still get the Twitter feed, if you, if you punch in Jeff Faulkner walking around nude, let's see if we can make me trend. This is actually me uh, photobombing the governor, our educational governor, Jim Hunt, at uh, J. J. Robinson Banquet, held in honor for him. You can't see it, but I got bunny ears down below. And, but the guy over in the corner is with the state police. He saw me. So this is me after I, was, I had to answer for my crimes, and so I had to tell him why I did the bunny ears. Oh, you got the joke. <laughs> Anytime now, you can take, you know, you can take pot shots at Mr. Todd. He's rich, number one, so he doesn't care. But uh, yeah, he's going through a little turmoil right now. This is kind of how I felt. But I, I really wasn't picked up by the state police. The objective of this session is to show how STEM education can be used to further enhance student, student learning in settings other than formal uh, classrooms, but also how you can actually use it to create a collaborative community uh, with other stakeholders in your community and even further. And I'm going to give you examples of that a little, bit, a little bit later on. I would like to first, before we go to this exercise, we've got a couple for you today, tell, me, tell you a little background. I am actually a lateral entry teacher. Anybody a lateral entry? You are? Really? Okay. Uh, anybody military, veteran? Anyone police? I like to ask that because, you know, I have, I think, Teachers, military, and policemen are the most underpaid. Not the most underappreciated, because we are appreciated. I, I get appreciation every day. But I think we're the least comp uh, compensated of any of those careers. So whenever, if I was hoping coming down here at Fayetteville, I would see a military policeman who's going to be a teacher. And I can tell them that, yeah, you really got the staff to underpay me on their forehead. We're going to do an exercise. But before we do the exercise, uh, yes, I'm a lateral entry teacher. Uh, my first interview that I had, I went back to my old hometown. I'm not going to tell you where that is, Caswell County, Hansonville. And when I got there and I was in the middle of the interview with the, with the human resource office, she said, you know, well, you look like a good candidate and, and we would like to give you a chance, but we don't hire lateral entry teachers because they just don't work out. Well, we got a couple of Kenyan fellows here, maybe three, who are lateral entry teachers. And actually, I found out later on that uh, the chairman of our Board of Education was a lateral entry teacher. Our superintendent was a lateral entry teacher. So I want to go back to Yensville and go, nah, 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 but I'm not going to do that. I became a teacher uh, because uh, one day I was out mowing in a day almost just like this. It was 95 degrees, I kid you not, and about 80% humidity in my backyard. And I was out there mowing. And all of a sudden, I stopped, and the little voice in my head said, stop what you're doing and go teach. At that time, I, I've been, I was in business for 23 years. I was a retail jeweler, manager, and owner of my own business at the very end. And at that time, I had my own store. And doing all right, paying the bills. But that little voice said, stop what you're doing, get rid of everything, go teach. And I went inside, and I told my wife. And she said, well, you got to listen to the little voice. And I went to my store and started to close it down. And I had my customers come to me giving me their business cards of their therapist saying, you need to talk to this guy. They knew I wanted to teach middle school. So they thought I was crazy. So you need to talk to this therapist. You need to talk to this psych before you decide you want to do that. But the rest is history. I went ahead and did it anyway. So I want to do this exercise with you. Now, this is a test run of this. This is the first time we've done it. So you, have to, you don't have to bear with me, but you got to do it anyway. I got you at three. Now, 
these boxes that we have have materials, and your job is to do this. You got eight minutes. We were talking on that way down here. We said, you know, we might give them eight minutes because it might be a little tough since it's the first time. You're going to get a piece of graph paper, and you're going to make something that moves with anything in the box in any form or fashion you want to. All you got to do is just make something that moves in a, a line or crooked, not counting gravitational energy, so don't let it drop off the table. Ah, see she was thinking. <laughs> and we're going to see who can make the thing that drops the furthest. The fact that we're in front of they copied everybody else's designs into their notes. To give it, uh, to give it some structure. They got their motor to work. For all we know, we have that. Four, three, two, one. All right, we have a winner. Does anybody have uh, a, a machine that works that moves of some sort? You do? Do you mind showing us? Here we go. Well, it moved. The battery, she, she used the battery. Uh, how about yours? Is yours moving? Um, it needs some traction. You have radial motion going on there. Yes. And if you had the, the tablecloth, you probably would have the traction to do that. Uh, the questions that we talked about. What were you thinking as you built your device? <laughs> what were you thinking? What in the world? What do you mean by that? I don't know what that means. <laughs> there you go. Anybody else? What were you thinking while you were doing this? We thought we needed something that was where you could have wheels and you could maybe move something that way and then it like blocked our thinking so then we had to go a different way. So because it was so open, yeah. you, th you had too many ideas yes. that, okay. Anybody else? What were you thinking while you were building it? What were two, uh, from another table, what were two major points of your thinking? What, what things at your table came across while you were discussing? The one was we kind of felt when we first saw it that we needed to see, use all of it. Uh -huh. You know, we had to use everything in the table some way. Or did you have to use all of it? Was that the criteria? But that wasn't. This is make something that moved. What, what, what are one or two things that were on your mind while you were building? So the, 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 the gist of this is it's wonderful that you guys got something to move. Uh, typically, people don't. <laughs> so that's but who does the best at this activity? And I think are usually people who are about the age of kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> they do the best with open-ended tasks because they have all these things and they'll try them over and over and over and over again. Still have to this exercise is not about you know whether or not you're a great engineer or whether you're a STEM you know, ideologue. This exercise was to get you to look at the other perspectives. There were different problems and different solutions. As teachers, the gist of this is that we all have common problems. We all have problem questions. We all have problem concerns. But our solutions to those problems are just as varied as this exercise. If you go around the tables right now, you'll see some really crazy stuff going on, which is beautiful. And in those crazy ideas is where innovation comes from. So that's what this was really about, is to just let you tear up stuff. I like to give kids stuff and say, tear it up. And they build something after you tear it up. So we're going to keep going here on that. Oh, this, this is a good <laughs> we are going to give you a plus delta at the end of this, and if you have any suggestions, uh, I really need them. This is the first time we've done this, and I, I really know how we can make this flow better. Uh, what you like about it, what you didn't like about it, that's going to come a little bit later. All right, so what are some entities in your community that you look for for help? There's some up there. Anybody got any that are not up there that you get help from? You know, you do, sometimes we tax our own resources to get the job done. Uh, churches, higher ed, business, and there are, there are a host of others. And, and our job today is to try to give you some ideas about who you can, can attack that to. Morehead Planetarium, uh, again, part of my 
Development as a teacher has come from the programs that they've offered. A lot of my development as a teacher has come from this internship and this experience that I've had with Kenny Fellows. And if you guys are not fellows, I suggest that you apply to it and apply to it and apply to it again because it is, it is, a, it is true development and it will help. So, how can we do this? I'm going to give you kind of uh, my quick synopsis. I'm going to very quickly now, and we actually have another exercise that we want you to do at the end. If you can quietly or just put everything back in the box, you don't get to keep it in my box. I have to take those back. I'm going to do this with my teachers back in my school now. Uh, how we get to this in Orange County, uh, I, I teach at Hillsboro, North Carolina, Orange County Schools. I teach at Stanford Middle School. I teach eighth grade science. And how we get to this is by looking at our strategic science plan and also our school improvement plan. Our principal was completely on board. When we started talking about STEM, she said, do whatever you have to do. And we're going to talk, discuss a little bit later about what that means to you guys. We're talking mainly about, we used to call it inquiry-based instruction, where we give a child a question or a series of questions and we let them go. Uh, there are different names for it now, you know, with the next generation science standards, some people call it the nature of science, uh, engineering and scientific processes, the engineering design process, it's, it's got a host of names, but really it's inquiry-based education. And a lot of it is what, it's what you're doing right now. It's exactly what most of us are doing in our classrooms right now. So, here's some, some, some research from the National Academies of Science. They've said that these are the goals of your STEM education. These should be your ultimate goals. And one of the goals is it's gotta be fun, and it's gotta be engaging. Uh, science, in most cases, I know in my case, science was most fun when I was doing stuff with my hands, when I was up moving around, when I was talking to the people across the, across the counter from me. And that's not usually how a lot of people look at science. And at the center of that, all those goals, of course, is the child. For me, this type of instruction is based on child-centered education, putting the child first. It's kind of a Montessori design by, in science, uh, leading, letting the child lead. So these are a couple of things, and I'm going quickly, uh, because I want Linda to get to what uh, Moorhead can offer you guys. But these are some of the things that we actually are doing in our school and have done. Uh, we have these things called STEM Talks, and all of this is driven by us wanting to become a North Carolina recognized STEM school. Uh, we're on a plan this year to get uh, to go through the process of being recognized as a North Carolina STEM school. There are sure accolades to it, but what we've come to realize is that if we can do this, then we incorporate best practices through all of our classrooms. Uh, we've embraced problem and project based instruction, and then, you know, some people call them both the same thing. They're a little bit different in project based. Uh, project based, you basically have an end goal. I did this from this project, and, and problem based is continuous. Yeah, I got problems, but from this problem that I've solved, I got more questions, so I, do I want to go that direction? And there are, there are delineations depending on who you talk to. We kind of call them both right now, taking baby steps. We're trying to incorporate problem-based instruction in all of our classrooms, not just science, not just math, but even in our language also. Uh, one of our biggest advocates is actually our physical education teachers. STEM Talks. We started a thing two years ago in conjunction with another community pro uh, partner. Actually, a lot of this is from, uh, from uh, Moorhead, but we started it with Duke University. They offered us up their engineering students from their Pratt School of Engineering, and they, come, they came every other Wednesday and gave a talk about what they do and how they got where they are. And it was valuable. It's nice to sit in front as the kids are fouling out and hearing them say, you know, that was pretty cool. That guy looks just like me. You know, I don't know how she did that, or I wonder if I can do that. So that was bad. Your, your Institute of Higher Ed can, can, can be a great resource. And they brought all kinds of stuff in. They did hands-on stuff. They did a couple of explosions, I'm telling you. About. Uh, Communities and Schools is an organization in our county that offers usually after-school and out-of-school projects. Uh, they actually started a STEM after school, which I had the, the luck to, to coordinate. And from that, we actually are going to do our own STEM after school now. The Board of Education wants to incorporate it in all the middle schools, and we're hoping that they take it to the elementary schools. Uh, I mean, people think that, for at least next year, STEM is the big buzzword right now. You go to funders, that's what they look at, and they go, oh yeah, we'll give you money if you're doing STEM. So, 
we're taking advantage of the, of the atmosphere right now. This year was our first STEAM camp. So we've gone to STEM, now we're trying to do STEAM. We put the A in there for arts, and this was a very successful. One of the cool things about our science summer camp, our STEAM camp, is that we had over 60 kids. Um, we had 99% attendance. They didn't miss a single day. We had one student that had to go out of town with parents for two days, and that's the only reason that he wasn't there. But the kids were there, ready to go, and they filled the time. It was a very good experience for some of the teachers, because what we did, the teachers were not science teachers. We made sure we had ELA teachers, math teachers. We had a chorus teacher. We had a PE teacher. We had our, our, our librarian there. And it was a great experience for us, more so than the students. And this year we had our first STEM career expo. We put the word out that we wanted to do this. We shut the school down for one day, and we put feelers out there for organizations, institutions, and companies. We got 26 uh, present presenters to come, and they gave concurrent, just like this, they gave concurrent sessions to our students all day long. And it was magnificent. Uh, teachers were there just for, to facilitate, to make sure they got to the right class at the right time. But it was a wonderful experience for the kids, and we did a course of Plus Delta to them. And every presenter has contacted us and said they want to come back again next year. So, again, uh, what we found out is that there are a lot of people out there going, yes, I'll do something, just ask me. So, why? Because all the stakeholders agree and recognize that STEM education is best practice. Uh, and middle school is a huge engagement tool for us, but sometimes because we're in our four walls, we lose sight of what's out there for us. You have to be innovative just like that black box and do things that look a little quack quack just like that black box. And, but if you think that way, along with everyone else in the school, it'll come along for you. So that's, this is what we do. Again, this collaboration kind of started with Kenan Fellows and with Moorhead. And that's why I explained to come and explain to you some of the resources they have for you. Because uh, a couple of places, Moorhead's one of them, our museums or others. We have some gems here in you know, this place. It's another one. We have some gems, some hidden gems here that we sometimes as educators don't take advantage of and they're right here for us. So she's going to talk about what Moorhead can offer. Moorhead, of course, is one of many um, organizations that you can tap into to enhance um, what you're already doing in your classroom experience. And so Moorhead's mission is to increase public understanding of science, technology, and health by um, utilizing UNC's unique resources. And so we have a mutualistic relationship with our community partners. Uh, that's accomplished through either on-site or off-site programming. So an example of on-site programming, have you been? I've had the off-site. Okay. With so, the living... The portable the planetarium. Living, that's yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah, so, so we have um, off-site programming, so the portable planetarium. We have a uh, mobile bus that can come to your school. Um, as far as on-site programming, we have, of course, field trips. So we have a, a full dome theater on the site of Moorhead. We also have discovery classes, birthday parties, and after school. So it is um, it's a long list of things that we can offer to schools and many different types of organizations. Um, and so a few years ago, Moorhead began to take inventory of what um, we were offering to the public. And so we realized that there were really that many opportunities for professional development for after school providers or out of school providers. Um, and so we developed uh, the Moorhead After School Training Program. And so that is uh, a one to two day training that is focused on the nature of science or how science is done. And the goals of MAST are to increase enthusiasm among students um, so that they develop a love for science and technology and that they can explore science and technology in the safe space of their familiar after school um, building or wherever they are for after school. Um, we also want to convey to students that you don't have to be in a specific place to do science. Science can take place on the school bus, it can take place on the playground in your backyard. Uh, and so we want to normalize the process of science so that kids understand that they're doing science every day whether they realize it or not. Um, and so in addition to 
focusing on students, we want to equip after school and out of school time providers with the knowledge and the resources to provide um, inquiry based instruction so that they can uh, increase their students' natural curiosity. Kids are naturally curious, we know this. Uh, so we want to sort of hone in on that curiosity, develop content so that we can inspire them to pursue their curiosities in any way that um, is appropriate. So these are the super seven process skills that we focus on uh, during this training. And as I said, these skills are employed daily um, by everyone. So we make observations daily. We question things daily. We hypothesize, make predictions, we plan and investigate, interpret, and communicate different pieces of information daily. And so we really focus on nature of science because teachers are already providing this content. They're already teaching these things to their students. We just want to supplement, complement, and reinforce what teachers are already doing. So we're going to go through um, each process skill quickly, and then we'll jump into our next activity. Observing is basically when you see what's happening and you jot it down. You're observing what happened, what phenomena, or what actions are occurring in a scenario. So then we have questioning, which is what it is. You form questions. Um, and sometimes those questions can lead to investigations. Hypothesizing, which can be kind of the most difficult one, uh, is when you are doing a conditional statement. If this happens, then this may happen. Mm -hmm. Hypothesizing is something that we do a lot in science, mm -hmm. and sometimes we form misconceptions based yeah. on the way we present. <laughs> then we have predicting. So we so this answers what will happen if I do this, um, and so you're using patterns to form ideas about what could happen to forecast the future. Planning and investigation, which is very key toward engineering. Engineering, the very first thing that engineering design process says is that you plan after you have your question. So this is an integral part of the STEM portion, particularly the E portion of the process. And then we have interpreting. So you're looking at, you're trying to figure out what is the, what, are, what is my data telling me? What are the results? And can I form a pattern based on those results? The last one is communication. Communicating is important. We talked about this on the way down here. One of the, uh, I had an internship with Duke University one year, and my job was to teach the engineering students how to talk to people. Because the professor said, you know, we do all these wonderful things, but we do a very poor job of telling people what we do. And so that's what I did. So communication is basically in science, telling the world what this is all about. All right, so this leads us to our second activity. So on the tables, you'll notice that some tables have a pop-up tent with um, instructions on them. So each station highlights a different process skill. Station three covers two process skills. So um, Jeff is passing out the sheet that you can write your um, thoughts on. So the goal is for you to rotate through each station and identify the primary process skill that each activity is focused on. No, I can go ahead. Five minutes. I'm going to wind it up a little bit. <laughs> now it's here. Uh, there we go. Paper. 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 Okay, so I hope you are all able to get a hundred. We're going to give you the answer. Well, not the answers. We're going to give you uh, what were the most obvious, the targeted uh, process skills we've checked And that's what they are. All right, so for the candle station, did anyone? Observing? No? What? Um, what about Velcro? Communicating? I love how these teachers here are correcting their answers. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> That's right. uh, mirror is interpreting and predicting. Hand of ice is hypothesizing. Uh, wet paper is questioning. The toy is planning. And so, 
Did anyone get all of them correct? Did anyone get three of them correct? Yeah? Okay. So who can tell me quickly, why do you think everyone's answers were so varied? Why do you think that is the case? Interpretation is different. Interpretation is different? Yeah, uh -huh. it would not, I mean, see things differently. Like the middle school or the right. elementary school teacher yeah. sees things differently than the high school teacher yeah. or the science versus the language arts. Sure. It depends on what you're taking into it. Right. Your background. So different interpretations and you're, you're building on prior knowledge. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you're using that as you walk through the stations. Excellent. What do you think? I'd say multiple skills are used in some of these. Yeah. So yeah. it was hard to narrow it down. Exactly. To yeah. And, and that was my next point is that um, even though these particular stations were designed to hone in on a specific process skill, it's impossible to, to use them mutually exclusively. Mm -hmm. So you can't, as you can see for the candle station, observing was a primary skill that was used, but you had to communicate and make predictions as well. And so for all of these stations, more than one process skill was used. And so it's hard to use just one process skill. However, if, if by chance you teach science, and you see that your students are a little bit weaker in some process skills than others, you can design specific experiences to focus on interpreting or hypothesizing. So that's what I really want to convey is that we use all of these process skills at the same time, essentially. It's hard to just observe and then just leave it at that, because that's just not how the mind works, how the brain works. Um, so we have uh, take home messages. So students use these skills um, every day, as I said earlier. Um, and they use all of them. Uh, each skill can be practiced simplistically or they can sort of be made a little more complex given, of course, the age group that you're working with. Uh, and again, you can redesign activities so that you can focus on specific skills uh, if your students are by chance weaker in some than others. So my take home, because I went through the training with Mass, I was uh, went up there one day and we did uh, we, were, we were kidding because we did this presentation uh, last week and this whole, what you just did, the whole presentation, the whole training, takes two days. We had to squash it in 15 minutes and we were screaming at each other like, what, what, which one do we knock out? And so we hope that you've gotten kind of a, a, a skeleton of what is out there and what is possible. Uh, for us in our school, uh, our principal instructionally has decided that we should be focusing on two things, really. Relationships. And this type of STEM education, inquiry-based, nature of science, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it, does create that contact between teacher and student, mm -hmm. between parent and student, between parent and teacher, between administrator, between everyone. And that's the major portion of what she, we feel like that if we can get the relationship plot right from the start, the learning will take care of itself. Uh, elementary schools, te yeah, teachers yeah. do that phenomenally, and sometimes we forget that you know, these are still kids, these are still children. The other thing is to focus on the process skills. Uh, we were talking down, there, down the road, we, we, uh, we, community, we coupled together, and I said, how many doctors know how to use the periodic tape? Well, they don't have to, they can Google it. They all have tablets now, they can just look it up. Well, it is not so important. The content is, we have standards that we all got to follow. But the, 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 the 21st century stuff that they're talking about are actually just processing skills. How do you solve a problem? How do you think critically for yourself? How do you create persistence in your learning? And one of the things that we're talking about in that veil is a child's metacognition. How do I know to think how to think? And so we're asking those deep questions, and, and again, with Keenan Fellows and with Morgan, all these issues have come out in <laughs> our little enclave at our school. And they came from this. They came from a group discussion. Sometimes it's not the program that makes things great. It's the discussions that you have in the programs, if you don't mind bringing those out and asking those questions and going forward through things. And then, again, having leadership and administration that allow you to do that. you got to have that, too. Our information is up there, uh, and, and, and this PowerPoint is available through the Kingdom Fellows, Lisa and Craig have it. If you want it, you can get it. Uh, we've kind of given them the lessons on there, too, of this. The, the mass lesson comes from the Explore 
how you pronounce it? Exploratorium. Exploratorium, which you can, you can Google exploratorium.com. They have tons. They have, I looked at 3,693 3, different activities that you can do, and all of them are cheap. They're not very expensive to do. And then the other, the black box I just put up, that's something, again, it's an experiment, and I'm going to fiddle with that. If you want to fiddle with it, like I said, Walmart. Uh, the boxes are actually cigar boxes, so if you're a smoker, don't smoke the boxes. But they're cigar boxes, and it's funny, I went to uh, the JR outlet and for when I was at Moorhead doing my internship, and I said, you know, we need some boxes for an activity. And the manager said, how about 300? <laughs> I said, okay, that's enough. And so I went and gave us, they just gave it to them. Again, sometimes you don't know, and my grandma said, if you don't act, you won't get it. So that's out there for you. We want to give you a plus delta so it can make this better, so I can make it better, Glenn, it can be better. And also, are there any questions? We'd be happy to answer any questions if you have it. Of this, thank you. You've been wonderful.